This recollection is in memory of the 10,000 conferences launched by the Universal House of Justice around the world to celebrate the nine-year plan. One of the themes is distances traversed over the last century. Today, we remember Seattle in this state of Washington. I am Zabina. And I am Jonathan. Looking back over the first 100 years, or should we say 120 years, of the Baha'i Faith, until its arrival in Seattle is a journey that started almost exactly with the formation and settling of the first pioneers in Washington State. It all begins on the afternoon of Easter Day, April 15, 1907, around 3.15 in the afternoon on Beacon Hill for the Baha'is. But much had to, be, had to occur that led up to this time in history. We will need to go back to 1844 in a faraway Persia. If one had to summarize the last 100 years of the Baha'is in Seattle, we would say that it started with a small band of pioneers who embraced a God-given mission that was far ahead of its time as envisioned by Baha'u'llah, meaning the glory of God, the founder of the Baha'i faith in Persia. Our pioneers here immediately grasped the idea to lay the foundation and infrastructure for a future society that would take for granted a global community, elimination of prejudice of all kinds by their racial, economic, or educational principles. The equality of women and men was not an option, and the sharing of wealth was a self-imposed spiritual quest. Today, these principles are well advanced and commonly accepted, however. In the 1850s, or by the turn of the century, our local citizens still find them to be a challenge. Hmm. It does not take long until our early Baha'i pioneers are asked to go to the four corners of the earth to help them open up new communities for this new world embracing message. They do so for the next few decades up until very recently you will find that many of those early Baha'i pioneers scatter far and wide, and for many, their bones are buried on continents such as Africa or Australia. Many of them leave good jobs and careers behind. Others travel throughout the country to spread the message of the earth is one country and mankind its citizens from city to city. It is only recently that our Baha'i community has begun to build up our own local community. One could make the comparison to Christ when he asked his early disciples to scatter to the four corners of the earth, and they did. In the same manner and with the same focus, mission and vision, these new pioneers arise heroically to sail and travel to distant lands, often under backbreaking and despairing conditions. But now back in 1844, James Knox Polk is elected president and promises to settle the Oregon boundaries. Britain is proposing that what is now Western Washington should be part of Canada, but he stands firm. Thus finally on June 15, 1846, the U.S.-Canada border is settled as the 40, at the 49th parallel with the Rocky Mountains to the sea. This is the same year that the Baha'i faith has its beginning. In the faraway land of Persia, a young merchant named the Bab, meaning the gate, arises and announces to the world the beginning of the latest, but not the last, of the world's religion. This movement throws Iran into turmoil between 1844 and 1853. Out of this turmoil emerges the Baha'i faith which is founded by Baha'u'llah. He was a Persian nobleman who served in the courts and in high places. The Bab is put to death in front of a huge crowd of a hundred thousand by a firing squadron in the city of Tabriz. Many a Christian and Muslim eyewitnesses are present and write about the wrongful death 
of this young 31-year-old prophet. He was almost the same age as Christ was during his crucifixion. Some even write plays about his life and have them performed in cities such as St. Petersburg in Russia and Paris, France, to be performed by no less than the famous actress Sarah Bernhardt. The Bab announces the coming of Baha'u'llah, the promised one of all ages and religions. He begins to lay the cornerstone and foundation for a new race of men. The Baha'is call it a blueprint for an ever-advancing civilization. They are made up of just a few principles, as we call them, and every Baha'i around the world adheres to them. Here they are. The oneness of mankind. The oneness of religion. Independent investigation of truth. Religion as a source of unity. The evolutionary nature of religion. Peaceful consultation as a means for resolving differences and internationally observing language. Universal education. The elimination of all forms of prejudice. Equality of men and women. The abolition of the extremes of wealth and poverty. Principles for the establishment of the universal peace. These few principles above become the roadmap and guidance for the Baha'is right here in Seattle. Often they feel hopeless and cannot see the wisdom behind their Northwestern experience on the horizon, but they believe and are steadfast in this vision. From 1850 until 1852, under the watchful eyes of a jealous Muslim clergy and with governmental support, Baha'u'llah endures and suffers the loss of his family, wealth, and properties. He is stripped of all dignity when he is imprisoned in Tehran amongst violent criminals. In 1851 until 1852, in a dark dungeon in a hollowed out cesspool below the earth on the Shah's palace ground, he and his fellow Baha'is suffer daily executions and torture. A much too heavy chain is placed around his neck that needs to be held up by wooden stocks so that his body does not collapse. No light, barely any food, and no privacy or release for private matters. Wrenching disease and stench is unbearable for months on end. It was here that one sudden moment in time Suspended before him, the angel Gabriel, sent by God, touched his burdened forehead. Only by a miracle does Baha'u'llah survive this ordeal for months on end. He is eventually released and returns to his frightened young wife and infant children. Now a series of exiles starts first to Baghdad in Iraq for 10 years then on to Constantinople and Adrianople in Turkey and arriving in Europe between 1863 and 1868. Finally, he is sent by boat for his last and final exile to the prison city of Akka, Palestine. When Baha'u'llah arrives in Akka, that city is a penal colony. Its population in the 1880s is estimated to be about 9,000. The Turkish government has consigned to it from its vast empire a great number of criminals, murderers, political detainees, and every type of travel maker. Many people think of religion as an activity that is carried out in a church, mosque, a synagogue, or a temple. It has an impact on important events in our lives, such as births, marriages, and deaths. It guides our pioneers and gives them strength when nothing else assists their failing bodies during wars, Indian attacks, or just surviving starvation from one day to the next. Whilst Baha'u'llah suffers in his underground prison in Tehran on this wet and rainy day on November 13, 1851, the Denny party, consisting of 12 adults and 12 children, 
land on the beach at Alki Point in West Seattle. It has been a long and difficult journey in four wagons across the prairies, the mountains, and eventually across the sea that brings them to this arrival only to find that shelter does not exist to shield them from the elements. The walls of a single cabin without a roof stand nearby. Dave and Danny try to ready the cabin for them, but cut himself with an ax as he tries to chop the lumber and is in deep fever by this time. Daylight soon fades and the women and children huddle around a campfire. A newborn baby, Roland, is just a few days old and begins life under most difficult circumstances. The first night is spent under hurriedly spread parts of a tent and Indian mats above the log walls to protect them from the pouring rain. They sleep close together, sharing their bodies, warmth for comfort. It is a monumental test of inner strength and endurance that leads to the founding of Seattle. In 1851, it is to become a new beginning for this tender city of 37 hills. The same can be said for our unknown small community of Baha'is, soon to leave their land of imprisonment. Around 1850, four years after the border is established, census takers count only 1,049 Americans living north of the Columbia, most of them near that river. It is the same year that 20,000 followers made up of men, women, and children of this young faith lose their lives across Persia. Little can they dare to dream that within 57 years, Seattle will register 56 followers within our city to officially form their blossoming young faith community. Most of Seattle's founders are church-going people. The first religious service is about a year after their arrival by Catholic Bishop Demers. He works to save the souls of employees of the Hudson Bay Company and the Indians. The new settlers ask him to come to Yesler's cookhouse to preach the first sermon. All of the settlers are Protestants, but it does not matter to them as it is the word of God. Seattle's second sermon is delivered by Methodist Benjamin Close, who becomes the first Protestant minister stationed in Washington State. The first resident minister, Reverend Blaine, along with his wife Catherine, arrive in Seattle in late November of 1853. His first sermon in the settlement is delivered at Alki Point on Sunday, November 27, 1853, the day after they arrive. About 30 settlers come to listen to them and their contributions add up to $12.50. So April 30th, 1858 marks the birth of our Baha'i mother of Seattle, Ida Finch. She and her husband John both become most instrumental in the rapid growth of the faith right here in Seattle and Tacoma, nay the country and different parts of the world. Ida has many small jobs during her lifetime to sustain her. They moved here in 1897 and eventually moved to 2916 Beacon Avenue South on Beacon Hill. The earliest we see her is in a needlepoint as a needlepoint teacher in her art store. She works at times at the Bon Marche behind the counter and later during her travels, she takes on small jobs in working in the store or assisting in a guest house. She seems to have a talent for dairy farming costs and production. She reports letters to Agnes Parson, a well-known early Baha'i at that time in Washington, D.C. She is a wealthy socialite and appears interested in the dairy industry and asks Ida to give her reports along the way. Apparently, she owns properties and a farm that she might be thinking about. Ida is an amazing woman with a strong will to survive, to follow her mission and dream. In China, we find her teaching English. She's an ardent letter writer on almost, on almost a daily basis. 
eventually Ida becomes blind and still writes letter by touch and feel. I have read those letters and I'm amazed how she sustains her correspondence without being able to read a single word. She apologizes, she apologizes for her demise in such an endearing way that tears come to your eyes. I understand towards the end of her life, she still walks around in her neighborhood blind with a walking stick and a pamphlet in her hands hoping that somebody will listen to her. We find her up in Monroe in the state of Washington. John is listed as a realtor around 1907. We see him soon regularly taking a boat ride to Tacoma and try to teach those that are ready for this new message. Ultimately, he will represent Seattle at our national convention in Chicago, Illinois, on occasion as we see his signature among those that attended. The 1860s witnessed the birth of another staunch Baha'i pioneer in the Seattle community. Her name is Charlotte T. Zutuvern Gillen. She was born July 10, 1869 in Springfield, Ohio. Her father, Charles Zutuvern, was a Civil War veteran and received the rank of Quartermaster General in the 17th Indiana Regiment. She starts to study music at the age of eight and teaches professionally from the age of 12 on. Eventually, she studies in the Boston Conservatory of Music and as a pioneer founding member, heads the musical department at the Stetson University of DeLand near Orlando in Florida. It is here that she meets and marries a trustee and on-site staff physician, Dr. Richard Gillen, MD, on August 16th, 1894. A daughter named June is born to them October 1st, 1895. The whole family eventually moves to Seattle in 1901 when their fleshly, freshly planted orange grove is destroyed through a most unusual freeze. Dr. Gillen opens a medical practice in Seattle. They live at the corner of Broadway and John Street. Later, between 1905 and 1919, they move to 1529 Summit Avenue. This is where Charlotte initiated the soon to be well-known Seattle School for Music. She teaches here for the next 20 years. This also gives her an opportunity to participate in and become part of Seattle's first World's Fair at the 1909 Alaska Yukon Pacific Exhibition. In 1907, Charlotte meets Ida Finch in her art or fabric store and learns from her the message of Baha'u'llah. She and her daughter June immediately embrace this wonderful new healing message for the ills of mankind. Charlotte will serve the faith for the next 60 years and her daughter June for no less than 85 years. This is a remarkable feat all on its own. And eventually our dear Charlotte meets Dan Jordan and embraces, who then embraces the faith. The highlight in both of their lives will be their journey in 1912 to meet Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, during his visit to this country. Both have an opportunity to talk to him privately for a few moments. June is a shy teenager and tells us that he holds her shaking hands to his chest and says, teach, teach, teach. And if you cannot teach, do humanitarian work. This guides both of their lives and all of their future decisions. Eventually, the family buys an apple orchard on Lake Chelan. Dr. Gillen passes away in 1916, but the family continues for many years to come to work their orchard. It is stated in Charlotte Gillen's obituary that their apple orchard might very well have been one of the first commercial apple orchards in the state of Washington. Think about that. Charlotte has a thirst for knowledge of an intellectual and spiritual nature. She studies for many years 
and still continues to do so at the age of 85 in Wyoming at the university there at the age of 90, she decides to pioneer to code in rough Alaska. What an enduring spirit, this determined, persevering, elegant, musical, beautiful, and humanitarian petite woman has. She truly is a role model for the modern woman to be always ahead of her time. She never lets hardship hinder her, nor let loneliness stop her from teaching music to choirs in the various surrounding churches when you read her annual letters on the last night of each year, you feel you're looking through a window of the last century, filled with wisdoms and yearnings for a peaceful world soon to come. She eventually dies here in Des Moines, Washington, on May 25th, 1962, with her granddaughter, Ruha and Ulale, their mother, June, at her side. Eventually, June Gillen marries Frank Harris, and this becomes the first Baha'i marriage initiated by Ida Finch. This takes place during one of the visits of the famous Baha'i travel teacher named Janabi Fazil. June is one of the founding members of the Standard Grand Opera Company during World War I. She is a beautiful singer, trained by Charlotte, and a gracious ballet dancer. Later in her life, she will become a scholar and researcher uh, in the writings of the Baha'i faith. This she did on an old-fashioned typewriter by categorizing and collecting phrases from the writings and by describing some of the physical and spiritual meanings. The 1870s witnessed, however, the birth of a female Baha'i heroine in Richmond, Ohio. Her name is Martha Louise Rood. She comes from Puritan family stock, settling in this country in 1640 around Salem, Massachusetts and Connecticut. Her family over the years had a history of missionary workers serving the rough part of several cities. Elihu Root became Secretary of War under President McKinley and Secretary of State under Theodore Roosevelt. He was a relative of hers. Eventually, he would become the recipient of the Nobel Prize in 1912, which acknowledged his international arbitration for peace. It is of no surprise that Martha eventually will be ahead of her time and become a known journalist as a society and religious editor for the Pittsburgh Post, spreading the message of universal peace is in her genes. But it is not until 1908 at an interdenominational missionary convention in Pittsburgh that she first hears of the Baha'i faith from a neighboring table. She overhears the conversation of a wealthy coffee broker named Roy Wilhelm residing on Wall Street who just returned from a visit with Abdu Baha. Just like Hyde done in Seattle, she immediately grasps the universal message of peace promulgated by Baha'u'llah. She knows instinctively the time has come to follow her new fate and destiny. It is this middle-aged, early Baha'i pioneer who will arise to meet the challenge to become distinct by leaving this country to travel around the world numerous times and eventually meeting kings and queens, emperors, professors and paupers. She is that humble soul that introduces Queen Marie of Romania, the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, to the message of Baha'u'llah. Books have been written about her, but we must mention here, but, but we must mention her here as she comes and visits Seattle to start one of her many journeys to the Orient. She teaches at over 100 universities and colleges alone. You can hear her regularly on the radio or read about her in the local papers. Fortunately for us, she is well recorded and leaves a trail of articles on her many presentations and speeches. She is closely involved with and promotes Esperanto, the international language developed by Dr. Ludwig Samenhof in Poland. 
This new world language is supposed to bring together the people of the world in the one common language. His daughter Lydia later becomes a Baha'i during the time that she works on translating Baha'u'llah and the New Era into Esperanto. Lydia has a law degree and is eager to teach this new global message of hope for mankind. Our dear mother of Seattle, Ida Finch, is there to greet Martha in Yokohama in 1923. Ida will remain in Tokyo until the great fire and earthquake in November of that same year. She travels between Japan and China with a Hawaiian Baha'i pioneer named Agnes Alexander. Agnes is from the renowned, that renowned early Hawaiian missionary family of the same name. Agnes had brought the faith to Hawaii in 1901 and is the first to open Japan and Korea to the Baha'i faith. It is Ida Finch who becomes one of her outstanding helpers between 1919 and 1923. Eventually, she and Agnes barely survived the Tokyo earthquake and the U.S. government puts Ida on a boat back to Seattle. She now has pioneered in the trenches of this country and part of the Asian continent. It is a remarkable accomplishment for a widowed woman in her early 60s during those trying times. But back to the 1880s, the world experienced the First World War and the Holy War in Sudan. The Statue of Liberty is unveiled and the Eiffel Tower is constructed Van Gogh paints his famous sunflowers and the Brooklyn Suspension Bridge opens. Saccharin is discovered and the first petrol-fueled car is developed. Seattle consolidates its status as a leading city in the 1880s. U.S. President Rutherford B. Hayes is the first president to visit here. Spring Hill Water Company is our first true water system. Even the Great Fire of 1889 here proves a blessing in disguise. Transportation improvements are the key to the city's growing success. A few roads outside of the original downtown are planked or paved. Regular scheduled ferry service will be introduced around 1888. October 9, 1889 is the year that Richard St. Bart Baker is born in Southampton, England. He soon will lead the way in the field of ecology and conservation and speaks to saving the greening of our planet. He will become lovingly known as the man of trees as he planted trees all around the world. Eventually, he finds the Baha'i faith and leads his community around him into a global awareness and consciousness. Just before he dies, he comes to Seattle in 1982 and meets with some of the Baha'is, such as Shirley Ballard and Julie Worthington, and other ecologists, only to find him on the threshold of the next world. During this time, we also find Tolstoy, in one of his books, say that we spend our lives attempting to unravel the mystery of life, but adds, there is a Persian, a Turkish prisoner, who knows the secret. Tolstoy was one of those who was in communication with Baha'u'llah. With him, he held that a life uncompromisingly sacrificed to the ideals is the life of the Superman. In faraway Akka in 1887 in Palestine, that little band of Baha'is around Baha'u'llah experienced the tragic loss of his own true and loyal brother. In 1870, Baha'u'llah loses his son, to a tragic accident. One of the early Baha'i historians named Nabil finishes writing a well-known historical biography of this young faith entitled The Dawnbreakers. Many of the early Baha'is by now are murdered, publicly tortured or banished. The vengeance of the clergy knows no limits, but overall it is still in obscurity. Well, that will change with the coming of the 1890s. The well-known Orientalist E.G. Brown from Cambridge University travels to Palestine to meet with Baha'u'llah. He has read the eyewitness reports of the deaths of the followers in Persia and becomes curious why such intense hatred 
is directed at this newly formed faith. He meets with Baha'u'llah and states that on that occasion, the face of him on whom I gazed is the interviewer's memorable testimony to posterity. Two years later, in 1892, Baha'u'llah passes away. It is this somber occasion that will bring about the first Western account into this country. In 1893, his son, Abd Baha, becomes the new head of the Baha'i community. His historic occasion for this change is in Chicago during the World's Columbian Exposition, World's Fair in 1893. The Northern Pacific arrives in January in time for some of our townspeople here in Seattle to cross the country in comfort during the month of September. Overall, some 100 nations participate and 28 million visitors flood through the gates. And yes, of course, the state of Washington has one of the most interesting and largest buildings named the Washington Building. Warren P. Skillings from Seattle is the architect for this very northwestern 140 by 220 foot building made entirely of huge logs from our evergreen state. It is highly visible with its 208 foot high flagpole of red fir. We don't know exactly how many visited from our state, but surely some of them might have attended the first world's parliament of religions. Some religious dignitaries from 19 countries, representing a total of 12 major world religions, share ideas on how to find common ground towards a more peaceful world. This has never been attempted in the past. How we yearn for another opportunity, such as in this year of 2022. It is on September 12, 1893, a little over a year after Baha'u'llah's ascension, that in a paper written by Reverend Henry H. Jessup, Director of Presbytery Missionary Operations in North Syria, and read by Reverend George A. Ford of Syria at the World Parliament of Religions held in Chicago in connection with the Colombian Exposition commemorating the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America. He announces that a famous Persian sage the Babi saint has died recently in Akka, and that two years previous to his ascension, a Cambridge scholar had visited him, to whom he had expressed sentiments so noble, so Christ-like, that the author of the paper, in his closing words, wished to share them with his audience. Less than a year later, in February 1894, a Syrian doctor named Ibrahim Kerala who, while residing in Cairo, had been converted by Haji Abdul Karim Itabrani to the faith, had received a tablet from Baha'u'llah, had communicated with Abdul Baha, and reached New York in December of 1892, establishing his residence in Chicago, and had begun to teach actively and systematically the cause he had espoused. Within the space of two years, had communicated 257 of his impressions of Abdu'l Baha and reported on the remarkable success that had attended his efforts. In 1895, an opening was vouchsafed to him in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, which he continued to visit once a week in the course of his teaching activities. By the following year, the believers in these two cities, it was reported, were counted by the hundreds. Following this, by 1898, Mrs. Phoebe Hurst, the well-known philanthropist's wife of Senator George F. Hurst, becomes attracted to the faith and expresses, expresses her intention of visiting Abdu'l Baha in the Holy Land. She invites several early believers among them, Dr. and Mrs. Getzinger, Dr. Kairula and his wife, to join her and complete the necessary arrangements for their historic pilgrimage to Akka. In Paris, several resident Americans, among whom were May Ellis Bowles, whom Mrs. Getzinger had won over to the faith, Miss Pearson and Anne Apperson, both nieces of Mrs. Hurst, 
with Mrs. Thornburg and her daughter, are added to the party, the number of which is later swelled in Egypt by the addition of Dr. Kairula's daughters and their grandmother, whom he has recently converted. By the time we close off the decade of the 90s, we will have experienced the Battle of Wounded Knee, the Spanish-American War, a Panama Canal scandal, votes for women were for the first time in the world assured in faraway New Zealand. A controlled glider and the first airship take flight. Radio communication is developed and we see the first X-ray technology come into existence. The first virus is identified. Freud steps into the world scene in psychoanalysis. The diesel engine is invented. Chemotherapy is developed and the first modern Olympic Games have started. This also is the decade when in 1894, the first American Baha'i, Thornton Chase, embraces this newly arrived faith within months of its first mention in Chicago at the World Fair. Hyde Dunn, a chocolate salesman for the just recently established chocolate factory known as Hershey's, arrives in California from faraway London, England, to become part of the Golden West. He had the pleasure in his early years in England, through his family, to sit on the lap of the famous author Charles Dickens. Thornton Chase, Hyde Dunn, and Colonel Nathan Fitzgerald's paths will soon cross in Seattle to bring this world-embracing message to our fast-growing city for the first time. The turn of the century is arriving. We can only imagine the hopes and aspirations that must have filled our pioneers in this northwestern evergreen state. 1902 is the year that Colonel Nathan Fitzgerald finds the Baha'i faith in Washington, D.C. and immediately leaves for Aka in 1904 to meet the son of Baha'u'llah, that is, Abdu'l-Baha, in Palestine. He is encouraged to spread the message of Baha'u'llah across this destined American country. He takes us to heart and around 1905 arrives in Tacoma in Seattle. Together there are 24 established Baha'i communities at this time in the U.S. Theodore Roosevelt visits Seattle the same year. Both bring different messages of hope for mankind and its future. Colonel Fitzgerald knows the destiny of America prescribed to this country by Baha'u'llah half a century before. Finally, this message arrives here, along with hopes for this newly founded Evergreen State. Here is what we... And here is what Baha'u'llah stated. And finally, as if to crown all his previous utterances, is this solemn affirmation embodying his mission of America's spiritual destiny. The moment this divine message is carried forward by the American believers from the shores of America and is propagated throughout the continents of Europe, of Asia, of Africa and Australasia, and as far as the islands of the Pacific, this community will find itself securely established upon the throne of an everlasting dominion. Then will all the peoples of the world witness that this community is spiritually illumined and divinely guided. Then will all the earth resound with the praises of its majesty and greatness. Stop. We need to stop. Even though recently we have been able to discover old newspaper articles that show Thornton Chase as a regional insurance salesman travels through the state of Washington all the way up to Arlington in 1900 and 1901. It is However, in 1905, in a tinker shop in downtown Seattle, that Colonel Nathan Fitzgerald and Hyde Dunn cross paths for the first time. Hyde overhears Nathan mention that he has just returned from a visit to Aka, Palestine, and quotes the now famous Baha'i statement by Baha'u'llah, let no man glory in that he loves his country, but that he loves his kind. This leaves a huge impression on Hyde to the point where he immediately becomes a follower of Baha'u'llah and joins this fledgling faith right here in Seattle. Within a few years, he and his soon-to-be wife, Clara, 
will leave for Australia and open the whole continent to the Baha'i faith. Clara Davis, as she is then known, lives in Walla Walla. She too is from London, just like Hyde, arriving in this country in 1902. Hyde and Nathan traveled there to that still tiny city in southeastern Washington in 1905-06 and began to lighten a candle here and there. Thornton Chase joins them on his travel on several occasions. Dozens of people now join the Baha'i faith. Nathan writes a booklet named The New Revelation, its marvelous message, which is sold in downtown Seattle in the New Thought bookstore around 1906. In 1905, he speaks before 70 ministers in Tacoma announcing and declaring the arrival of God's kingdom on earth. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, meaning the future blueprint for humanity has been once more revealed. 1907 now becomes the most historic year for the Seattle Baha'i community and its surrounding localities. The United States Census counts a total of 1,280 Baha'is. On April 15, 1907, we have a total of 56 Baha'is registered in Seattle. 30 of those have good addresses known to us at the present time. It is decided to officially form the first Seattle Baha'i Assembly, a well-known Disciple of Abdu'l Baha has extensively traveled throughout the country, helping and assisting communities to form. She is invited by Wallace Bussell, who resides right here in Seattle. He is a young attorney and filled with energy and enthusiasm. He had met Isabella Brittingham in Washington, D.C., and invites her to come for a visit. She gives a series of talks around Seattle. It is Easter and she encourages the friends to gather to form themselves into a spiritual assembly. 13 of the local Baha'is organized themselves to meet at 2916 Beacon Avenue South on Beacon Hill at the home of Ida and John Finch around 3.15 p.m. Ida herself has just found the Baha'is this very year, year in spring. In, Ida Finch becomes the mother of Seattle until her death on December 28, 1942.